What's going on Bears fans? It's Cars here for this week's review of the Packer game. And like most of you, I've had one hell of a week enjoying this. Uh, this has been a long time coming. You know, I've felt we haven't been really this kind of this good in a long while. And I look back even in that 2010 season, uh, it was when we were really on our last legs in the Lovey Smith era. Uh, I know we came back two years later and went 10-6 and six and missed the playoffs, but it never, nothing ever felt easy. Nothing ever felt good. Nothing ever felt like we were uh, quite ascending the way that we are today. And I enjoyed it. I have two uh, really close friends that are Packers fans. Uh, they did not return my texts or calls for over 24 hours. And this is really unusual for them because they've really enjoyed this run from Favre to Rogers and beating us a lot more and and always being confident that the division could be theirs because they have Aaron Rodgers and they're all admitting that they've got to deal with his own mortality now and wondering if years and years of hits are starting to really pile up because he was feeling such ghost presence and so when they finally when they finally responded uh it was it was thoroughly enjoyable and i will take that you know um i'm of the kind of the belief that we've been struggling for way longer you know i know we made the playoffs in 2010 i know that we came close in in 2012 but realistically we haven't been this good since 2006 right since our super bowl run and while that game, that season had some more memorable victories and more memorable plays i'll never forget the uh arizona cardinals game uh this defense feels significantly more dominant this offense certainly feels better but that's that is probably the world's tallest midget kind of competition but uh this is fun and as bears fans we should enjoy it you know unfairly we get a lot of comparisons to the uh the jacksonville jaguars last year and how you know one year later that they're so much worse and you know we've we all know that certain dumb pond pundits have called uh mitch trubisky the blake bortles of the nfc north but you know all that's happened for that jacksonville defense from from last year to this is i believe their dvoa went from First to seventh, so a sixth place drop, and that team can't even sniff the playoffs. Now the good news is I think that we have some some improvements to come on the offense, but that's to be saved for a later date. Let's let's talk about this game. You know, for me, even even with Aaron back there, and you never feel completely comfortable because we've all seen him make the plays, make the throws. Um, come back to bite us. Uh, there's, there's this, for lack of a better term, a ghost that is that has been here every time we've got the lead in the fourth quarter. Um, if I went back and when I went back and watched this game with out my bear fan blinders on, this was a game that wasn't really ever out of grasp. The Bears controlled the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. And you really have to give props to the offensive line, who really did a good job. And I get that uh, Green Bay doesn't have the players that it once was. It's why I think they're highly overrated as a uh, as a head coach opening, because the talent isn't there. And I'll probably talk more about that later, depending on how much I keep ranting. But the offensive line was faced with a defense that is not content to let you pick them apart and because they can't generate pressure with their front seven especially with mike daniels out and kenny clark out and clay matthews off of the jute uh older than he uh once was um he came with some really creative and aggressive blitzing sending corners and linebackers and confusing looks and not letting you know where the pressure was but the bears picked it up every time to the tune of the fact that the Packers throughout that game managed only one sack and two quarterback hits throughout the game 
On the other hand, the Bears had five sacks, nine hits on Aaron Rodgers. I mean, that's such an impressive number. If you put a quarterback who dropped back 42 times, you put you dropped him 14, you hit him. A lot's been made about his accuracy issues, and I've kind of been all over him for that all year, and this is another game where he completed less than uh, 60% of his passes, and his yards per attempt was way down. But part of the reason he was missing is because he felt pressure that wasn't there. One of the things I wrote in my article was, you know, you have to wonder after 10 years if the hits are starting to pile up on Aaron Rodgers. And it's something that happens with every quarterback. You know, if you're uh, David Carr and you're drafted by the Houston Texans, who draft a Division three football team to play offensive line in front of him, and you proceed to get sacked something like 70 times uh, in your first two years, you've, not, you've got no chance. Absolutely no chance of getting comfortable back there. Aaron Rodgers, in his 10-year career, is sacked on an average of about 7% of his dropbacks, which is nearly double what it was for Favre, and it's definitely double of what it's been for for Tom Brady. So he gets hit more than anybody. You know, like, right now, the person I'd say that to, to compare him to, and you have to watch, and I'm going to watch with great pleasure, is Deshaun Watson just gets destroyed each week. Um, but you're seeing this with, with Aaron Rodgers now. And, and so, so many of these throws, he's throwing early. He's throwing in anticipation of being hit. And he's not throwing in anticipation of where the receiver is. This is why he's long. This is why he's short. This is why his accuracy is all over the place, because he's sensing pressure that isn't there. The difference was this week, the pressure was there. So you really have to give hats off to this this defensive line and offensive line and the linebackers and tight ends. They did such a phenomenal job at controlling the line. And there are several plays that I love more than any other, but on that touchdown run from uh, Jordan Howard, Trey Burton seals off Clay Matthews, which five years ago doesn't happen. And Jordan Howard runs a 10-yard pass and gets a 9-yard touchdown run without even being touched. That doesn't happen in the NFL anymore, right? Because of how condensed things are, you really have to be good to make a, a, a touchdown run in there. He didn't get touched in a tight field where there are defensive backs and linebackers everywhere. And part of that is because Trey Burton flat out took Clay Matthews out. I may have shed a tear there. I was so happy. Uh, but... It was such a great play. And it was just... Uh, plays like that just kind of keep showing how much we control the entire line of scrimmage. Now, the opposite of this is a point of concern, I would guess I would say, is that that score should have been a lot more than 21 points. And I know there's been a lot of questions about uh, Matt Nagy's uh, play calling, and I'm going to warn you, this is going to be a, a Matt Nagy uh, positive uh, <laughs> podcast here. But, um, you know, there's a lot of concerns about the third and two uh, Mizell RPO and the fake punt and the wildcat with three Cohen. And I'm going to tell you right now, I disagree with Mizell being on the on the field. I get it. But that was a first down if Mitch pulled the bat ball back and threw it to Trey Burton. Trey was open. He had at least another 10, 15 yards in front of him, I think, if I'm remembering the play right, that he could have gotten. And, and yes, Mizell, there was a place for the ball to be, uh, but there were so many defenders. That's one that I think Mitch should have pulled back. And if you watch uh, the, the tape, Matt's pulling him aside right away. And he's saying something to him. And I think he's saying, you missed a throw there. You got to read your cues because there was a throw to Trey Burton to be had. And he missed it. But these little miscues, right? That play, the the, the fake punt, which is really the only play I disagree with, or, or the wildcat fumble. You know, these are little plays that we are away that I think we easily get to 30 points against this Green Bay team. This is a game that was never really in doubt, although we just all felt it was in doubt. 
And so I'm going to go through a couple of high-level shout-outs uh, for what I found the most impressive this week. Um, and I'm going to end with the coaching staff, but I'm going to start with our defensive backs. And, you know, you look at the stats and you see the numbers that Devontae Adams put up. And, you know, I know he's been saying for a while that he's the best receiver, at least in the NFC. And I I, I am inclined to believe that, yeah, he really is. I mean, there are there are throws that and catches that he makes that he should just not be able to, that the so well defended he shouldn't even be able to see the ball. You know, the one uh, with, with Prince Mukamara all over that angle, covering all of his eyesight, and he still makes that catch. That's incredible. But we let him, he had his yards, and we made him work for it. We made him earn it. But... The defensive backs, uh, especially Sherrick McManus, on such a sh- on, on such a week of just taking over after really not at being asked to play a tremendous amount of defense, what they did to confuse and switch routes and give a look right and pass things off like they were passing off. Dan Orlovsky did a, a good uh, good one on one of the last sacks for from Rogers in which. You know, like the safety and corners are handing things off. We're the most aggressive defense I've seen at just passing coverage off to take away short routes. That's the biggest change from week one to now is that Vic really looked at what they ran and some of the concepts that they'd run where they'd have, you know, two receivers on one side and they kind of run these semi-pick plays. And the Bears were so good at diagnosing that this was going to be a pick play. And that meant that after their first initial response, when they got close together, that they switched. So you'll see if you watch a lot of these routes where the Packers have two guys close. They're going to basically run rub routes or, or pick routes uh, and, and go. And you're going to see really quickly that each time that comes close to a collision, collision these guys are backing off and going with the other man, and it really made things difficult difficult for Aaron Rodgers. That's some next level shit right there, and that takes extreme confidence in your defensive backs and your safeties to read, diagnose, and make these plays, and do so all at the same time. Right? If these things go bad, all it takes is one man, one safety, your nickel, your corner to misread and misdiagnose a play, and you've got two guys going with one and one guy wide open for a touchdown, and that didn't happen at all. That's next level. I mean, Kyle Fuller for sure de- des- uh, you know, deserved his Pro Bowl this year. Uh, Eddie Jackson, I think there, there's absolutely no question there. But you know, Amos, to me, he doesn't show up in the stats a lot. He's not having the PFF fan year that he had last year, but his football intelligence has definitely improved since he got here, and he's making some of these handoffs, some of these reads, and this is this is a big moment for all of us. And I think if you look at what what that means, uh, I really got to go back and watch that Rams game again because I think we're going to see a lot of those same concepts. Bears defensive backs aggressively switching. On, on rub and pick and, and close by plays. That's awesome. Nobody else, I think, does that. I haven't seen any team kind of jump these routes and these concepts, and that gives you a lot of a lot of love for what Vic Fangio is doing back there, and it would be a travesty to lose him. Um, but I do think we're safe because if you look at this past year, uh, Matt Patricia has really lost that locker room. Steve Wilkes, I think, is going to get fired. Uh, all the guys that are that are out there are that are doing well are all offensive coaches, and they're younger. And I think that bodes very well for us keeping Vic Fangio. But in the same breath, I'm throwing that guy a ton of cash. And I, you know, I know that there are some other of the uh, local uh, posts and, and podcasts talking about how we need to lose Vic and how he's bad. I just don't think they're seeing it, and that's that's fine. You know, everyone's got their own viewpoint, but from my eyes, my uh, less than trained eyes, what I'm seeing is a is a defensive coordinator that's being extremely 
aggressive in some of these play calls is making teams pay for double teaming uh, Khalil Mack, which is no easy feat, and that's that's a thing of beauty. Uh, the second thing I want to talk to uh, is is Mitch, and you know I give him all the credit in the world for this comeback game that he had. You know this is we will go as far in, in this as he will let us, and you know this season has probably been a little bit more downs than ups than what I expected. And that's not to say he hasn't had a tremendous year. Um, I am guilty of having probably too unrealistic of expectations for Mitch, and I'll be the first to admit that, and that that's obviously somewhat accelerated by what Patrick Mahomes has done. A lot less for me, Deshaun Watson. I still, uh, there's a lot in that game I, I, I can dissect, but you know, to see what Patrick Mahomes has done is definitely, for me, as a fan, put more of a spotlight on Mitch, but... What I love about him is his leadership is second to none. This team loves him. This team believes in him. You could tell that all these guys will go fight for him, fight with him. And after a week where his mechanics were god-awful. like If you watch that Rams game, and I, I have to watch it again, I just have to do a tremendous amount of tequila uh, ahead of time, is his mechanics were all over. It wasn't his shoulder, it was his lower body. You know, th- this whole throw left thing that uh, that's up there, part of the reason he struggles with his left is when he kind of takes a natural step back and tries to swing to his left to make a throw, he gets his body balance off. He kind of, someone mentioned on Twitter, like it's like a swinging gait. Like he really oversteps to his left and it throws off his center of balance, Throws out of his throwing motion, and that's why everything kind of sails. And the, the the improvement that shows that the most is that throw to Trey Burton uh, for the touchdown. Last week, that throw he misses. It's not getting intercepted, but that throw sails. That throw um, easily is, is an incompletion. And when you watch him, right... He takes a step, he sidesteps to the left, he had made that determination, he saw the coverage that he was looking for, he knew Trey was going to be the, the route, he knew he was going to be uh, have a really good chance of being open, and I think, pausing here, that's a huge step in his development and what he's seeing in some of his pre-snap reads at the line, uh, that's a throw that he probably doesn't make early in the season either. Uh, but when he makes that throw, he doesn't swing all the way open. He probably overswings just a bit, but that throw was pure money. And to to go from week to week and fix that small, that, well, large flaw, but he fixed it in a week. He looked at the tape, he watched what he did, and he fixed that in a week. That's all you can ask for. You know, we're going to go as far as Mitch wants us to, and and Mitch takes us. And to see that, that's huge. And I think, you know, he unfairly has gotten a lot of criticism for his running. You know, one of the best things about him that I saw at North Carolina that's continued here is that when he's chased out of the pocket, and I could do a whole podcast on his pocket feel, right, especially after that, that incredible play to Adam Shaheen I've probably watched 57 times. When he's pushed out of the pocket, his eyes are always downfield. He's always looking for the play. This isn't Josh Allen. You know, this isn't these young guys whose first thing, or Lamar Jackson, whose first thing is like, oh shit, I just got to run. Running is his third option, right? His first is to stay in the pocket, make that throw. His second is to get clear of the rush and make that throw. Third is to get that yardage. And that's what you want in your quarterback. I don't know what Mitch is going to be, and that's probably what scares me the most. I can see a really good, really good career. I could see a really middling career, right? And it'll always be in the shadow of what Pat Mahomes is doing. Um, You know, Pat Mahomes, this is an uh, an otherworldly season, but... Just because Pat may be the better physical specimen, he may have more tools, he might be 
the overall better quarterback doesn't mean that we drafted the right guy or the wrong guy, excuse me. You know, when you look back, Drew Brees is a record-setting quarterback. He's won one Super Bowl. Everybody likes to talk about Aaron Rodgers, right? He's won one. He's been in two. You know, those guys have as many Super Bowl wins as Trent Dilfer or Brad Johnson, right? Being the best physical specimen of a quarterback doesn't mean anything in the NFL. What matters is leadership. It's so cliche, but it truly matters that if you have a quarterback that your teammate believe in and they want to play for and is a guy who's a team first guy, those are the guys that win Super Bowls. And yes, that's also a veiled shot at Aaron Rodgers. Mitch has to be consistent. I know these two next games mean a little less, um, but he's got to consistently go out there and do that. He's got a tough test in San Francisco, right, against uh, against Richard Sherman. That's going to be a tough look for him. He's got to excel. When we go back to Minnesota, he's got to excel. Minnesota's probably going to be in a playoff hunt, and if you read my kind of my weekly observations article, they've got a better shot than most uh, to make that seed. That means that they're most likely going to be the sixth seed with Seattle having two games uh, at home. Mitch has to be there. This, the, these two games have to be when he puts it together because as Mitch goes, we go. Last but not least, and as you could tell, this pod is running a little longer uh, than most because this is just such a moment, momentous occasion. Um, Matt Nagy does not get enough attention in the national spotlight for his play calling. Now, I'm going to go for a few minutes here talking about why I think he should be coach of the year, but I don't want him to win coach of the year because that position seems to be cursed. I think it's I, I think it's kind of like the uh, SI cover curse, so please give it to Frank Reich. I wholeheartedly endorse his candidacy. But there's something I want to talk about that Dan Orlowski did a little bit in his, his Twitter breakdown of the uh, the Jordan Howard run. And I want to talk about the evolution of that play. So earlier when I talked about some of these uh, the issues we've had in, in the run game, um, you heard me mention we do a lot with these jet sweeps, Right. We do a lot of these these stretch plays to to really try to keep as many defenders out of the box, try to open the center of the box uh, for Jordan Howard to give him some more run room. And early on in the season, especially against some more aggressive defenses, we saw us really deploy these jet sweeps. We saw them happen two, three times a game with either Taylor Gabriel, with with Miller, um, you know, with with other folks out there. I think we've even faked it one time to uh, Josh Bellamy, right? So this is a play that's been a staple in the beginning. We don't run it now at all. I don't, I, maybe I'm struggling to remember, but that hasn't been a, something that we've called or had run for a while. But it's such a threat. And so when you go back and you look at that play, right, the fear, what they're doing now, and the way that they're drawing these things up is now he's taking the next evolution of that play. He's sending someone in motion. He is sending someone away to try to uh, to draw some attention that they have to respect. Even though we don't run it, it has to be there. Then he sends, right, the, uh, he's culminated that with, we've run this this shovel pass time and time again to Trey Burton. I think we even ran it in this game, right, where off of a jet sweep, we fake the handoff to, to Jordan Howard, and we give a shovel pass to, to Trey Burton, who's basically coming in. Um, sometimes he does it like he did in this touchdown play, he does a wham block, but otherwise, He's a guy that we hit for this little shovel pass, five, six yards. So now defenses are looking at this play and they're like, do I have to trust the the uh, the motion? Is this going to be 
uh, Trey Burton, is this going to be another one of these these little shovel passes? Or are they going to give this pass off uh, or hand this directly off to Jordan Howard? Like that's, Orlovsky says it's two plays in one, it's three. I mean, all season we've been running this play. We've added a second. We've added a third. We're kind of continually just evolving these calls. So teams are seeing these formations. They're seeing these concepts time and time again, right? They're, they're getting comfortable like, okay, this is going to be a fake jet sweep. This is what's going to happen. And wham. Different play. So I get being upset about a lot of some of these play calls, but what I don't think he gets enough credit for is just how evolved this offense has been with all new guys, right? New new left guard, new right guard right now. New tight end. Three new wide outs. This is, this is not something that's easy. Everybody has this scheme and it's brand new. And this playbook, this playbook, we're probably still not even through the prologue on. And Matt Nagy is already doing next level shit. Like, be afraid when the playoffs come if you're a defense because you have no idea what's going to hit you. And what we've seen with the focus on the run game and how much better the run game has looked over the last couple weeks, you can't take for granted that, that we're not going to run the ball. You know, I think uh, one of my favorite lines is always, you know, the greatest the greatest trick the devil ever played. And I'll tell you right now, Nagy's playing a hell of a trick because he's setting everybody up for one thing and come playoff time, it's going to be something completely different. And if he unlocks fully Maserati Mitch, there's no chance that anybody else has against us in the playoffs because nobody has a defense like us. We've seen this week after week of just how good this defense is, how aggressive, how 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 much of takeaways that they can create. And now that one kind of it's always been, well, that offense, you know, well, that Mitch, you never know. Look at that. Look at that game against LA. It didn't look that great, right? Look at that game. Look at this game. If all he's done all season is built up to something in the playoffs that no one's ever seen before, I for sure won't be shocked. Well, I've taken up enough of your time for this evening. Thanks so much for listening. As always, you know, you can follow me on Twitter at CarsKeys1. And you can read any of the stuff that I put up on the bar room. But looking forward to celebrating this playoff uh, run. And uh, let's see how far we go. Bear down.